a fairy tale, but in reverse. Do you start out in a beautiful ball gown and end up at stained rags cleaning up your, cleaning up after little people? <laughs> Ever heard of a job that requires no experience, gives no training, pays nothing, and you can't quit? That's motherhood. And other people's lives are on the line. Nothing is truly lost until mother can't find it. Motherhood means that half the time I feel like I'm running on an asylum, and the other half I feel like you belong in one. <laughs> Mom's recipe for iced coffee. Have kids, make coffee. Forget who made the coffee, put in the microwave, forget it was in the microwave and drink it cold. Does anybody here have a little anecdote or something to say about their mom? Anybody have a little something about have some amusing thing or something about their mom? Anybody? When I was in high school, I played football. And I uh, always made a habit of coming home and not taking stuff out of my gym bag to dry. So one morning before school, I just opened the dryer and threw my stuff in and shut it and turned it on. Well, my mother had uh, uh, a bright idea that if you put any baked goods in the dryer, it kept them fresh. <laughs> now, she had a Boston cream pie in there. <laughs> so needless to say, I got the hairy end of the broomstick out of the house that morning. <laughs> and Boston cream pie all over your yeah. gym clothes. <laughs> Did anybody have a mean mother? No? Everybody had a sweet mother? I have something I'd like to say. Go ahead, brother. Uh, you know, my dad died when I was three years old. And uh, we actually, by today's standards, we were poor. We really were. And, uh, but, you know, we had something that was more important than material things. Yeah. We had a mother's love. Yeah, my dad died when his father, my dad, my dad's father died when he was three, too, and they grew up in, in poverty. But they didn't know they were poor, you know, because they had food and clothes. She made the clothing, and uh, so she kept it together. Mothers do that. Mothers are the bedrock of society, really. There's a lot of mothers in the Bible. Eve was the first one. She was the mother of all mankind. I think of the mother of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. It was Noah's wife. We don't even know her name. Mothers are unsung heroes. Sarah, mother of Isaac. Rebecca, mother of Esau and Jacob. Rachel, mother of Joseph and Benjamin. There's a lot of them. And I think of the young girl who was a virgin who agreed to bear the physical form of the Messiah when he was a child, so she would have mothered him. Let's be clear about that. Mary was not and is not the mother of God, as some think. God never had a beginning, therefore he was never born, therefore he never had a mother. Mary is not the mother of God, but she's a precious person in Christian history. Mothers are women who raise children. Some women don't bear children, but mother them anyway. Mothering is more than just bearing a child. Mothers are the primary nurturers. Even their bodies are built for that. Their hearts are built for that. Their, their DNA is built for that. Care, feeding, protecting, guiding, teaching, disciplining, first responding, mother's kiss to make it all better. This story is about one of the mothers that Jesus encountered 
And he had just healed the centurion's servant at Capernaum. He had called the twelve. He had started his public ministry. He had been healing people, and he was getting famous. He was addressing crowds of people, saying things they hadn't heard before. In Luke chapter 7, starting verse 11, it says, Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. Now picture this. He's going... He's nearing the city gates of a town called Nain. And there's a crowd following him. They followed him everywhere he went. They wanted to see him in person. They heard about the miracles and they wanted to know what he was going to do next. So picture this crowd. It was a large crowd, a lot of people. And they were probably noisy, excited. They were with Jesus. We need to be noisy when we're with, with Jesus. Heaven's not going to be a quiet place. <laughs> but he was able to do miracles, cause impossible things to happen. And he spoke great truths into their lives. The great truths are recorded in our Bible. They were joyous, happy, celebrating, and noisy about it. Picture that crowd heading toward the gate, the town gate of Nain. Verse 12, as he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. So now we have two crowds. We have a large crowd that's following Jesus, noisy, jubilant, upbeat, and we have a sad crowd with this precious mother. A funeral a procession was encountered. The dead person was a young man, and he was an only child. His mother was a widow. She had no husband. In those days, a widow who had no children, if she had children, she could depend on the children, especially sons, for a living. If she had no children, then she would be destitute, having de to depend on the community for well-wishers for a living. Maybe she could glean, you know, like Ruth the Moabitess did. Maybe she could glean, but in Deuteronomy, it, the, the law was that the community had to take care of the widows. But notice the character of this other crowd. They were noisy too, but in a different way. There would be wailing. Both crowds were loud. This crowd would be crying out, wailing, mourning. There would most likely be paid mourners. They hired people to mourn for them. There would have been sorrow. Hearts gripped with the loss of this young man. Friends of theirs and sorrow for the plight of the widow, his mother. Notice the difference between these two crowds. The crowd with Jesus happy, upbeat, joyful, declaring the praises of God. The funeral crowd and this poor mother was sad, joyless, uncertain of what would become of this mother. Most of them knew the young man. It wasn't a real big city. They remembered when he was born. They had seen him grow up. They had seen them together as a happy family. Now he's gone, and her husband is gone, and her happy life is over, this poor mother. One happy, excited crowd. One sad, gloomy crowd. And in the middle was Jesus between those two crowds. And the dead man. Those are the two people that are in the middle between these crowds. Jesus and the dead man, the young man. 
Jesus was going to ruin the funeral. <laughs> he was going to spoil this funeral. There isn't much you can do to ruin a funeral. I grew up in a funeral home. We never had a ruined funeral that I knew of. But I heard of a lady minister who fell into the grave while she was ministering a funeral. That's true. And I personally talked to a funeral director who fell into the grave. <laughs> you can do something like that. Well, that doesn't really ruin the funeral because the person is still going to be buried. But Jesus really did spoil this funeral. Verse 13, when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her and he said, don't cry. Jesus had emotions just like we do. We're made in the image of God, including our emotions. God has anger, he has pleasure. And his heart went out to her, don't cry. Obviously she was crying. Most likely loudly wailing. I've seen that many times. As the hearse is there and the casket is being put into the hearse. I've seen it. Loud wailing. As I was a kid growing up. Her loss touched the heart of Jesus. He may have been thinking of his own mother and the grief that she would go through when he went to the cross. His response speaks of the John 3.16 compassion that God has for us. Jesus' love for her caused his heart to go out to her. She was crying. Maybe he was crying too. Jesus wept. I could see tears. He said, don't cry. Lamentations chapter 3, 22 and 23 says, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God knows what you are going through. And it touches his heart. His compassion for us was powerful at the cross. He didn't wait. He didn't want this widow to suffer torment of life alone and destitute. So Jesus did something about it. Verse 14. Then he went up and touched the beer. The beer, the beer would have been like a short-sided wooden stretcher that they carried the decedents on. He went up and touched it. They were carrying him on this, it was like a wooden stretcher, it wasn't a casket. But this touching was a powerful, it has an implication, it's powerful, because touching a dead person or something that a dead person was on would make him unclean ceremonially in the Jewish traditions of the time would make him unclean. He made himself unclean in order to help this widow that his heart went out to. Jesus was criticized for associating with sinners, unclean people, tax collectors, publicans, sinners, people like me, people like you, sinners. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Continuing in verse 14, it says, when he went up and touched the beer, and the bearers stood still. Can you picture that? They're on their way out of town. She's crying. They're all crying. The happy crowd comes along. Now they're probably getting really quiet. Jesus and the dead man's in the middle. He touches it. And the bearers stop. He stops their progress. The funeral is on the way to the grave. If the Jesus crowd had been an hour later, he might have been buried already. When Jesus shows up, the progress of our demise halts. It stops. When Jesus shows up and you take him as your Savior, you were on your way to perdition 
But now that stops and you're on your way to heaven. We were on our way to a spiritual grave when we're living in sin. When Jesus touching us, that progress to the eternal grave stops. Now we move in a different direction. We're moving towards God. Still in verse 14, he spoke to the young man. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. Now he's talking to a dead man. But he knows what kind of power he has. Jesus has brought three people back to life. Each time he spoke to the dead person, he speaks to people who are dead in their sins. I know, he spoke to me when I was dead in my sins. Each one of you can probably say the same. Not audibly, but with a still, small voice, the impression of the Holy Spirit, the voice of conviction. Some hear that voice and turn away from it. Instead, just deciding to go their own way. Verse 15, the dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. He began to talk. Wouldn't you like to know what he was saying? Oh, I'd love to know what he was saying. He had been dead. He had, been exper he had experienced death. Few people experienced that and come back to tell about it. Ah, the story he must have told. He must have told that the rest of his life. So Jesus gave the resurrected man back, it says, back to his mother. He was gone. She was without him. Then she was in terrible grief and she had no one to look after her. Now, thanks to Jesus, he's back. The Bible doesn't record her reaction, but you can kind of picture it. <laughs> she was still crying, but not tears of grief anymore. Tears of joy, happy tears. She probably couldn't wait to get her arms around him. Her grieving turned into celebrating. She was probably jumping up and down and grabbed a hold of him and wouldn't let go and praising God. Verse 16, they were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. Now it says they were all, we're talking about both of those crowds now. They were all filled with awe. And they said, God has come to help his people. And verse 17, this news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. They were all filled with awe. Both crowds, the jubilant crowd that had been following Jesus and the grieving crowd, all of them now praising God because he has called this dead man out of death back in to life and given him back to this poor mother. Mothers all mother. That's what mothers do. When you're growing up, if you get a boo-boo, Mother is the one you want. If you're sick, sore, or hurting, a child wants his mom. No one else will do but mom. Mothers will go hungry to make sure their kids are fed. They'll go around in old clothes to make sure their kids have decent clothes. The first object of a child's love is its mother. The first thing he recognizes is mother's voice and his mother's face. A child will hear about Jesus at mother's knee. If you need a swat, <laughs> probably mother supplies that too. My mom used a fly swatter on me sometimes just because it was handy right there. If I could make it to the back door and get outside, I'd run away from her. And I was somewhat safe temporarily, but I was reared. I mean, many times I was reared. <laughs> and I probably didn't get as many rearings as I deserved. Mother is a legislator. She makes the rules. Don't touch that. Keep your hands out of the cookie jar. First thing you do is don't touch the electrical outlets. Don't touch this stuff. And then and they go to extremes, put up gates in the house and Go to extremes, make sure stuff is up high. You don't want the child to touch. Make sure there's no solvents they can get into. 
Don't touch that. Don't eat that. Don't step in that. <laughs> the enforcer. Do as I say, because I'm the mom. That's why. If a child is threatened, mother turns into a protective wild beast. She goes for the throat. Several, oh, it, it could be 15 years ago, it could be 20, I don't know. I had a little Wednesday night group in the church in Altoona. It was called Straight Arrows. And uh, this kid was about five years old, a little black boy. And his mother and dad were estranged. And his dad was at the back door, pounding on the door, shouting, I'm going to kill you. And he wouldn't stop, and he was going to break the door down. So this lady shot him right through the door and killed him. Protecting herself and the little boy. There's lots of stories about mothers going into action in defense of their kids. We have a mother right back there in the back seat, and her son was hurt real bad in an accident, and she managed that care, and she wouldn't leave his side, and she stayed there and stayed there, and we all prayed, but she, she, she was right there. She wouldn't leave that to anybody else. Amen? Is that right? Amen. Right there. Mothers do that. Mothers endure grief from their own kids. <laughs> Teenagers give moms a lot of grief, a hard time. And, and, and in their quiet moments, they think about that, and it, it grieves them. But they take care of that. Anyway, it's a teenager. You get through it. <laughs> Mothers pray. Christian mothers will pray for years for the salvation of their sons or daughters. For years. Jesus comes along and brings life to an errant, unsaved child. They're brought to life just as the young man of Nahum was brought to life. You know, this is interesting. Nahum and Shunem are not very far apart geographically. And Shunem is where the Shunemite woman prayed, and Elisha said, pro prophesied that she would have a child by this time next year, and sure enough, she did. When he was a few years old, he went out in the field, had a headache, and he went, his dad said, take him to his mother, and he sent his mother to that, and he died sunstroke or something, we don't know. But she took him up to the room on the roof that she had made for Elisha the prophet. And, went, and then she went to the prophet and he came there on a donkey and he went up and stretched himself out on this boy and brought him back to life. It's interesting. Shunem and Nahum are not very far apart. And God brought life back to a child in both cases. <laughs> I think that's pretty, pretty cool. When I got saved, you know, my, I, we, but my brother and sister and I grew up in the Catholic Church. When my mother married my dad, she had a sign of paper promising that she would not interfere with our upbringing as Catholics. When each of us came home from first grade the first time, we came home, and my brother and sister, all, all three of us, Mom, you're going to go to hell because you're not Catholic. Because it's the nuns, the penguins, told us that. So Dad had to have a talk with us and straighten us on each one of us one at a time. But my mom was a very godly woman. She would not allow any book to be placed on top of a Bible that wasn't a Bible. She had that. But she didn't interfere, but I knew she was praying for us. I know she was. But when I got saved, I wrote a letter to my my mom and dad and my brother and his wife and kids all lived in the same house at that time. My dad was in a wheelchair, so my brother moved in there to help. And, uh, and he worked a job out of that house. But I wrote a letter to that family, and I said, The Spirit of God 
has moved me to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I wrote that letter, and I addressed it, dear mom. And what I heard later was that she put the letter down and said, Hallelujah. <laughs> I don't know, I was 25, I guess, and she must have prayed all those years. Mothers do that. They don't give up. Our sons aren't serving no more, but I know she prays protection over those three sons. Every day she prays protection over them. Mothers do that. That's what mothers do. And my mother won because my brother got saved. I wrote him a letter. I said, get yourself down to an AG church. And they went as a family, and he and his wife got saved. I called my sister up on the phone, told her all about it. She got saved. I led her to the Lord on the phone. So then my dad was the only one. <laughs> the only one left. And they started taking him to church, and he turned his heart to the Lord also. So she won. <laughs> she won over the whole family without saying a word, just by living her life as a godly woman, as a godly mother. That's what Christian mothers do. Yeah. Mothers are awesome. Just awesome. We can, I mean, we can all, if I took the microphone around and asked for stories, you'd, you'd each have a delightful story about your mom. And I thought my mom was mean. When you're a teenager, mom's mean because she doesn't want you to do what you want to do. <laughs> you emerge out of that childhood phase, in that teen phase, it's kind of, it, it's hard for parents because, especially when they're around 14, 13, 14, I guess girls get into it sooner than boys do, but, but it, you emerge out of it. But it depends on how you pray, how you emerge out of it. I'm convinced of that. And there are a lot of stories about women that prayed for 20 years, 25 years for the salvation of their children. That's what mothers do. If you're a mother, would you stand? So I want to pray for all the mothers. You guys can stand up right where you are and stretch your hand out and just agree with me in prayer if you would. And uh, then moms, you can pick a posy. I have marigolds and what, zinnias? Is that what those are? And uh, every other one's a marigold or a zinnia. But Lord, we thank you for these Christian mothers. We thank you, Lord. For the heart that they have, a heart after God, first of all, and a heart that you put in them to mother their children. Oh, God, it's a, it's a mysterious thing. We take it for granted, but it's a miracle. It's a miracle, Lord. So I ask your blessings on each one of these moms that have born children, that have nurtured children, that have gone through different kinds of grief, joy, and sadness that motherhood brings. Joy and sadness, but there's a triumph at the end of it. So I, I just ask your blessings on each one, wherever they're, whatever they're doing, whatever, they're, whatever their life is all about right now, 
that you would be very, very real to them, Lord, that your presence would be real, that they would know and understand that Jesus had the same compassion for them as he had on this bereaved mother. So I ask your blessings, Lord. I ask you to continue to fill them, to guide them, to encourage them, to challenge them, Lord. And to, and, and to help them to realize that there's going to be an awesome reward at the end of this trail, the end of this path of motherhood that they're on, Lord. When they get to heaven, when they get to heaven. So bless them, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.